Good morning and welcome to Cross Community Church. Uh, I'm excited as we begin a new year together. Uh, I'm just thinking back uh, last year, uh, the prior years, all that God has done. I'm, I'm excited about what's ahead for us. Now, as I begin today, I probably need to take a minute and clear up my Facebook posts because uh, I've had a lot of questions. People are like, hey, what's going on? I know I don't post a lot on social media. It's kind of a, a big event. Uh, but just to clarify on the front end today, uh, number one, I'm not leaving. Uh, Lord willing, I'll be here uh, as long as I, I live. Uh, I would love to spend the rest of my life in this church. Uh, so I'm sorry if I made you afraid of that. Number two, and this may be a little more disappointing, we're not starting the parking lot yet. We still got to raise more money. It's going to be a while. Uh, y'all can pray toward that end because we want to do it soon. Uh, but what I do want to do for you today is just look ahead to what I believe that God has for us as a church. And I want to do that by first just looking back and telling you a little bit about my experience here at Cross Community Church. You may not know this, but I was actually raised in this church. Uh, as a kid, my family would move back to Poto when I was three years old. And I remember the, the old building downtown and uh, walking in, and, and really this is what I, I've known uh, to be church. That's what I first experienced or remember to be church. I remember when my mom uh, walked an aisle and gave her life to Jesus. And I didn't even know what that meant at the time because I was such a young kid. Uh, but I saw the transforming power of the Gospels, and I, I realized what it meant to be saved because I watched as my mother's life was transformed. Uh, listen, I was served. I was discipled. I was taught. I was disciplined uh, by people in this church, men and women who poured into me. Nancy Billings taught me in the kids' choir, and, and there's a special place in heaven for her as a result. Many people loved me and cared for me and had to bear with me through difficult times. I didn't always receive it well, uh, but I, I, was, I got to be raised up in this church. I got to be cared for. I got to be served. I remember mission trips and church camps and, honestly, God's constant presence with us as a body. Even when I was running from the Lord, God was there with me. I remember going off to college and realizing not, that not every church is like this one. That, y'all, I know it's not true of us, but churches out there, they have issues, and there's brokenness, and there's a lot of pain. And I was like, I, man, that's not been my experience. Church has always been wonderful. I remember going or being called into ministry, and I, I served in other places, but uh, always had a love for this church in my heart. I remember 15 years ago, God called me back to serve here, my, my home church, people who had poured so much into me and the joy that came with getting to come home and, and really getting to serve my friends and, and the community that I love. And it's just been an incredible ride. Now, when I came back 15 years ago, I'll be honest, our church was struggling. Uh, I remember walking in and I was kind of in charge of um, Sunday school, that kind of thing, and, and remembering that there were less than 50 adults involved in Sunday school. It was kind of heartbreaking for me. Like, this is my home church, you know, and um, I was sad. There there had been some, some painful conflicts, some difficult times, um, and it was hard to work through those days. But over the last 15 years, God has been so good to us. We have grown significantly. I mean, look around the room. We've grown significantly. We've watched as people young and old have been saved and baptized. And so many of us have got to share a journey of discipleship together where we've been challenged, where we've grown and we've matured in our faith. We've still got a long way to go, but we have grown together as a body. I remember when we got the opportunity to plant a church in Pecola. And many of you, you prayed and you served and you gave to make that a reality. And now it's been over a decade since it's been in existence. I remember when we got to send our first missionary to China. And once again, that's something that we did together as a body. And five years ago, God gave me the overwhelming privilege of becoming your pastor. Pastoring the church has been such a crucial part of my life. And I, every day, am thankful that I get to serve this body, you as a church, who you are, the individual people, and who we are together. There's nowhere else that I would rather go, no other church I would rather pastor. Man, I love you guys, and I'm thankful for this opportunity to serve people who have poured so much into me. From day one, 
in my leadership here as a pastor, I just felt compelled that we needed to continue the legacy of discipleship that I got to benefit from that had been begun here many years ago that we needed to press in even more toward becoming disciples ourselves and then making disciples of one another. So early on, we asked all of our members that we would covenant together, that we would organize our life around six practices. We call them the six practices of a disciple. And the, all of these practices are really just designed to give our heart more to Jesus. It's devoting daily, gathering here consistently as a body. It's living in community with other believers, serving one another faithfully, giving sacrificially, and engaging missionally in our community. Now, as a church, as we pursue lives of full devotion to Jesus, we have been blessed beyond measure. As I said, man, we've grown. We've seen people come to faith in Jesus. Our lives have been transformed. People have been delivered from addiction and brokenness and pain. Marriages have been restored. Families have been reconciled. And all of that points back to God. Now, when we began to focus in and strive to make disciples in our church, God began to stir in my heart uh, that the Great Commission didn't just call us to make disciples here, but it also called us to make disciples in, in places that we've never been, among people that we didn't know. And God began to burden my heart that we needed to become a sending church, which means we sacrificially send people and resources to places that need the gospel, places that may not directly benefit us, places where we may not even get to see the fruit. But God had called us to be a sending church. And not long after that, God gave us the opportunity to practice that. Um, it wasn't really anything we'd done. God, through a set of um, really unique divine circumstances, brought us into contact with a church called Lego LBN in Guinare, Venezuela. And at the time, we did not know them well. We weren't all that well connected. Uh, but we had an opportunity to partner with them and to begin to invest in them as a church. What they needed was money to buy a generator so that they could have electricity consistently during their worship services. Power grid there is pretty bad. Their kids' ministry is trying to function in the dark. And, and we didn't know them well. And to send thousands of dollars to another country, on another continent among people that you don't know well, it was a difficult decision. And we prayed about that together as elders and just asked what God would have us to do. And I'll never forget the night we're sitting in an in elders meeting and, and Gary Jordan, he began to just speak this scripture that made it clear that we should dive in and we should help them. It's Ecclesiastes 11.1 1, and it says, cast your bread upon the waters for you will find it after many days. And among the elders, it became clear that we needed to take a risk, that we did need to sacrificially send uh, resources to a, a place that we didn't know all that well, uh, among a, a church that we weren't all that well connected with. But when we did, we had no idea that that would be the beginning of a beautiful and a fruitful partnership that continues to this day. Not long after that, a friend of mine made a need known uh, among some church planters that they were connected with in Fetier, Turkey. David and Monica Taylor had been planning a church in that city, and due to some shifts in the government, um, they began to revoke visas of Christian missionaries who were in Turkey, and they started sending them home. And yet God in his goodness had provided David and Monica an opportunity to purchase the building that they'd been renting for their church. And in so doing, they were able to become legal and permanent residents. And so once again, we're praying, God, would you really have us sacrificially send resources to this place? And we, we prayed and we talked and Y'all, I was pretty full of faith. I'm not going to brag, but I'm bragging. Uh, I was like, maybe we should send them $5,000. You know, like that would be a huge blessing to just to contribute to what they're doing. They could purchase that building and they'll be there. And Craig Marquardt, another one of our elders, he spoke up in that meeting and he was like, guys, if you look, man, God has been so good to us. I think we should send them $50,000. And in the middle of that meeting, it just became apparent to us as elders, like that's what we need to do. And so we wrote a check for, we didn't write a check. We, we've got $50,000 to Fetchier Turkey. And uh, David and Monica were able to purchase that property. And today, a growing church is thriving there. God has used them not only to take the gospel to the people of Turkey, but they've also received and cared for many Ukrainian refugees as a result of the war. They were able to minister to their country through a really significant and devastating earthquake uh, for many of them. Y'all... Since then, God has brought us numerous opportunities to participate in and to engage missionally all around the world. God is using us, 
a small church in a town most people have never heard of to take the gospel to places that most of us have never been. We've been able to support gospel centered mission work in North Africa and in the Middle East and Venezuela, and now we're partnering with Lego LBN to send church planners to Madrid, Spain, where a church is pretty soon going to launch. Hopefully, the middle of this year, we'll get to see that. And I don't know if you've been paying attention, but even while we've begun to focus more outwardly, God has continued to bless us here inwardly. If you look around today, uh, our service is really full. God has continued to send us people, connect us with people, and next week it's going to continue. We get to celebrate two more baptisms that mark lives that have been transformed by the gospel. I'm truly thankful as we look back, and I I really want to just share that with you, you all the things that happen in a local church are not a result of the leadership. They're not a result of us. They're God's work. But God has worked through every single one of you, your prayers, through your service, through your giving, through your investing here as a church together. God has enabled us to do extraordinary things that just absolutely blow my mind. And after all that God has done, here's the firm belief that I have. This is just the beginning. That God is not done with us, but there is more ahead. There are, the God has more for us, more meaningful and fruitful work ahead of us. And so today, what I want to do is share with you what I believe is a profound opportunity that is right in front of us. We don't have to go across oceans for it. Uh, as a matter of fact, it happens right here. And here's the thing that I believe God wants us to begin to do. You're not going to get it at the first probably, but we'll get there. I believe God is calling us as a sending church of of people who are sent out by Jesus into our community to begin to love our community by practicing the simple but forgotten act of hospitality. Here's what John chapter 13 verses 34 and 35 says. Jesus is speaking to his disciples. He's about to be arrested. He's about to go to the cross. And he looks at him. He says, a new commandment I give to you. That you will love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. And by this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So Jesus tells us that the thing that's going to mark us as disciples of his is the way in which we uniquely, as the people of God, the way in which we love one another. And we aren't just called to love people who are, you know, they're kind of like us. They're, they're, they're tight with us. They jive with us. Well, we're called to love our enemies and people that we don't even know, strangers, foreigners, whoever it might be. We are called as the people of God to love them and to do so as Christ has loved us. Now, I told you we're going to talk about hospitality today, and so I want to take just a minute and define that. If I say hospitality and you think sweet tea and peach cobbler, that's not exactly. That may be part of it, but that's not exactly where, where we're going. Or maybe for you, you're a little more of a high-end hospitality kind of person, right? When I say hospitality, you might think of, uh, of seasonally appropriate decor, right? Of, of really nicely prepared gourmet meals, a polite conversation together, maybe for you. Um, I I read this in, uh, what is this magazine? Oh, Southern Living. Uh, They gave six qualities that define true Southern hospitality. You can kind of match these against your own definition. Um, Number one, politeness, of course. right? Good home cooking, absolutely. Um, Kindness, helpfulness, charm, and charity. Now, listen, whatever your definition is, And they're probably okay. Uh, What I want to do today is define for you what I believe the Bible teaches us about hospitality and what Jesus is calling us to as we seek to love one another through the simple practice of hospitality. Um, Our definition comes from the Greek word for hospitality. We'll see it in in Hebrews chapter 13 in just a minute. But it's an interesting word uh, that, that is used by the writer of Hebrews. It is the Greek word philoxenos. You don't need to know that or you don't need to remember that. But basically, it's two words that have been smashed together. The first is is philos. It means to love. Uh, It's it's simply love. And so Philadelphia is the city of brotherly love. That's phylos from that root word. Uh, The second word there is xenos, philoxenos. And that means strangers. 
the biblical word for hospitality, it simply calls us to love strangers. That's what it literally means. When we practice hospitality, what we are doing is we're loving people that we do not yet know. They're foreign to us. Now, it doesn't mean they're foreigners. It just means that they're foreign to us. Now, this, this idea of practicing hospitality, and it's littered throughout the scriptures, and it's something that we should not neglect. I want to just give you a few examples here. In Deuteronomy chapter 18, or chapter 10, verses 18 and 19, God tells his people to love the sojourner. This is the word for foreigner. And to give them food and clothing. Leviticus chapter 19, 34, God tells us to treat the stranger who sojourns with us as natives among us. And we shall love them as ourselves, for we were strangers in the land of Egypt. God's chosen people. We were foreigners in the land of Egypt. In Romans chapter 12, verse 13, we're told to contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. In 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 9, we're commanded to show hospitality to one another without grumbling. Whole another level, right? Without grumbling that we have to clean the house or whatever that might be. In Hebrews chapter 13, 1 and 2, we're called to let brotherly love continue and not to neglect showing hospitality to strangers. Hospitality is a required characteristic. If you're going to be an elder or deacon in the church, you have to have this ability to show hospitality. You have to love strangers. I had a conversation with a a man just this week, and he was talking about the difficulties of moving to a new place and, and just like learning how to live life there, and you don't have all the connections, and you don't know, you know how the, the sports leagues work or how the school functions and, and how essential it is just to have people that, that you can ask questions to, that can kind of take you around and show you how things should function. Like it's, it's an important thing to have people that will reach out and help people who are new to the area. Listen, I don't know if you've been paying attention But God has been sending a tremendous amount of new people from all over the United States. Been sending them into our area. Some of them are devoted followers of Jesus. Some of them have no religious background at all. But here's the thing. I believe that Jesus has called us to love every single one of them. New people who have come into our place. And then there are people who have have been here. We we did a, a survey, had it done for us by Lifeway about 15 years ago. And here's what it found that within 15 miles of this building, there are 30,000 people. And most of them do not know Jesus Christ. They don't have a church they call home. They're disconnected, right? And beyond that, we see that there's an epidemic of, of loneliness, especially among older people. And they're alone. And we have the opportunity as a church through this simple act of hospitality to begin to minister and to care for people who may be strangers to us today, but hospitality is seeking to turn strangers into friends, to show the love of Jesus Christ to people by serving them and and by caring for them in our home. Ultimately, hospitality is loving others as Christ loved us. So let's let's just think about this as, as believers. We, if you're a Christian in this room, we were enemies of God. We were separated from him due to our sin. We couldn't fix that on our own. We were stuck. But God intervened on our behalf. He loved us, and he came after us, and he went to the cross, and he died for us in order to bring us into a relationship with him. That's what Jesus had done for us. We were strangers. We were foreigners. We were enemies even. Jesus pursued us. And then went to the cross to die for us that he might draw us into a relationship with him. So you and I, we, when we practice hospitality, we're just reflecting to other people the love that Jesus Christ has already shown to earth, to us. Hospitality is both an attitude of the heart and a practice of the hands. Once again, it is an attitude of the heart and a practice of our hands. Again, with practicing hospitality, we're seeking to turn strangers in the friends, and in so doing, we might just have the opportunity to see them become family as well. I've recently become familiar with a, a lady named Rosaria Butterfield. I don't know if you've read uh, much of her work, but she was a professor of English and women's studies at Syracuse University. 
Um, she, I'm going to give you her description of herself. Her primary field of study was critical theory, and she described herself, bear with me, this is her description, as a lesbian feminist and a radically com- committed unbeliever. Okay? Lesbian feminist, radically committed unbeliever. Uh, while researching the religious right and their politics of hatred, she, as she defined it, Butterfield ultimately wrote an article criticizing the Promise Keepers movement. She was criticizing, kind of taking beef with anyone who considered themselves religious, right? And a man named Ken Smith, he read her letter and decided he wanted to respond to her. So he, he or she read her article, so he decided to write her a letter in response. In the letter, he addressed some of her concerns, and he invited her over to dinner at his house. In their home, Ken and Floyd Smith, they just began to love and care for Rosaria well. The invitation to dinner wasn't a one-time thing, but it was a repeated event. Come back next Thursday. Come back next Tuesday. They continued to love and to care for her. They served her. They shared meals together and had conversations together. Because Ken and Floyd were believers, they were going to pray together. They were going to talk about the Word together. And through her time with the Smiths, Rosaria began to reevaluate some of her previously held convictions. And after reading large portions of Scripture, Rosaria came to faith in Jesus Christ. Listen, hospitality is where we seek to turn strangers into friends. And our hope and our prayer is that those friends would ultimately become family as we love and we care for and we share the hope of the gospel with other people. So here's the thing. Today, I want to invite you to begin practicing hospitality like this with us, that this would be a commitment we make as a church, that if you consider this your church home, you're like, I'm in, I'm going to do it, I'm going to practice hospitality. And, and we can do this in, in two ways. First is personal hospitality, the second is corporate. So I'm going to give you just three tips if you're going to practice personal hospitality in your home, among your family, um, three tips for that. So number one, be prayerful. At the heart of showing hospitality is a love of strangers. If we don't have love, the scriptures would tell us we have nothing, that we would prayerfully come before the Lord in the mornings as we devote ourselves daily to Jesus Christ, and we would just remember, like we were once strangers to God, we were foreigners, we were even enemies of God, but Jesus intervened on our behalf, gave his life in order to draw us into a relationship with him, and out of the overflow of the gratitude for what Jesus has done, that we too would love God and we would love other people enough to intervene on their behalf, to extend an invitation to them and say, hey, would you come and just join me in my life? So when we think about personal hospitality, it begins with prayer. If we don't have love, we have nothing. Just say, hey, God, would you help me to love you and other people as you love them? Would you help me to see strangers not as inconveniences and not as invaders in some way, but as an opportunity for me to share the same love, to show people how much you love them? So number one, we're prayerful. Number two, if you're going to practice personal hospitality, I want to encourage you to be intentional I don't know about you, we don't have a ton of free time around my house. It, it doesn't happen, right? We're busy, our kids, they play sports, they're involved in various activities, and it, it can run our lives if we let it. If we're going to practice hospitality, we have to be intentional. We have to say this is something that's important. We have to put it on our calendar. To be honest with you, for most of us, if we're going to show hospitality to people that we don't yet know, so you can turn strangers into friends, um, it's actually going to be far more costly in our schedule than it even is to our pocketbook. Man, the sacrifice that we make is one of our evenings or, or lunches or whatever it may be. It's a sacrifice of our time. And so we have to be intentional if this is going to happen. So be prayerful, be intentional. And then number three, I just want to encourage you to invite somebody and to begin investing in them personally. Maybe it's a neighbor that you don't yet know. You've seen them, right? They live across the street or, or down the road. You've maybe waved at them in passing, but it's somebody you don't yet know. Hospitality is seeking to turn strangers into friends. So you just invite them. Hey, would you and your family 
come over for dinner. Or maybe it's the new kid on your, on your child's ball team, and they have a family that goes along with them, and you would intentionally say, I'm going to intervene, and I'm just going to invite this person. I want to turn this stranger into a friend. Hospitality always begins with an invitation, making someone know that they're loved and they're welcome through a simple invitation. Now listen, hospitality, it doesn't have to be extravagant. You don't need a huge house and fine china and gourmet foods to practice hospitality. You need your house, your dishes, and your food to practice hospitality. We're not inviting people in trying to impress them with how great we are. Uh, we all know we're not that impressive, right? We just invite people into our real lives. Sometimes the, the old dishes, their mismatched plates, the, the meals that don't go well, we're inviting people into our real lives. That's what hospitality is. It's sharing our lives with other people. And so we invite people in and we serve them and we care for them and we ask them about their lives. We just share our lives with them and hopefully we do so over the long run. Personal hospitality, be prayerful, be intentional, and then just invite someone and invest with them over the long term. Care about them, serve them, love them well. Now, the other component of this is corporate hospitality, what we do as a church, how we love people together and collectively. Um, This is going to sound a little bit out of place, but number one here, how are we going to do this corporately? Here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Number one, Make this your home. Make this church your home. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, and if someone says, hey, where do you go to church? And you say, Cross Community Church, out there on the north end of town. You know, if, if you consider this your church home, would you make that official? Like, would you just go ahead, um, go to membership class, re-up your membership with us, just say, this is my home. I'm going to identify myself as a member at Cross Community. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 through 14, we see this. It describes the body as, hey, we're a body with many parts, and there's eyes, and there's hands, and there's feet, and there's ears. There's various parts of the body, and every part is dependent upon the others. Can I just tell you something? Church is not a service that you attend. If that is the idea you have of church, would you just like wipe that out of your memory? Church is not a service that you attend. It is a body that you belong to. Now, I want you to imagine this. If you were to, God forbid, um, cut off one of your fingers, you would not consider that something that you'd be a little passive about, right? Yeah, you know, it's kind of disappointing. hate that, but I'm kind of busy at work right now. I'm not going to mess with it. Listen, if you were to cut off a, a, a part of your body, a finger, whatever it might be, that would be an emergency, right? You would absolutely um, get that thing on ice. You would get to a doctor as quickly as you could. You want it to be reattached just as soon as you possibly can. Why? Because something that is unattached will soon be unalive. And there's this epidemic among American Christianity that says, man, I'm going to show up on Sunday, but I'm not really going to belong. Man, I'm, I'm just going to kind of be anonymous. I'm going to show up to a service. Hopefully it's good. You know, I'm going to enjoy. I'm going to receive, but I'm not going to belong to the body. And so today, as your pastor, I'm asking you, become a member of this church. If you consider this your church home, you're a believer in Jesus. Um, if you have issues you want to work through, please talk to the elders. We want to visit through those things. But make this your home. By the way, Joey mentioned it. We have a membership class next week during the second service. You can sign up online on the app. You can go to the Welcome Center if you don't want to mess with any of that stuff. Um, and if you are a member here, you've already been a member you should have gotten an email this morning to re-up your membership to say, I still do, man, I'm in. I'm, I'm a part of this church, and I want everyone to know it. It is through membership that we love and care for our members, our people who are here, the elders who have been called to keep watch over the flock. This is how we know who the flock is. And honestly, this is how you know who the rest of the church is. We have a membership directory that's online, and you can go look and be like, oh, She's a member. That's someone I can depend on. That's a part of the body here. So once again, as we practice corporate hospitality, would you just take the time to make this your home? And and if this isn't the place for you, man, we bless you. Go and find the church that you're willing to commit to and invest in and say, I want to belong here, right? So number one, make this your home. Number two, and this is a little more sticky, treat it like it's your home. If If you're here and this is your church, would you treat it like it's your home? Did you know that you act very differently 
um, when you're a guest in someone's home than when you're hosting guests in your home. You know what I'm saying? When you have guests in your home, it's a totally different experience than when you are a guest in someone else's home. You know what the difference is, right? It's who's doing the serving. Like when I'm a guest in people's, I, man, I just show up. I usually don't have to bring anything. I'm not prepared. I mean, I kind of bring myself. I just show up, and I'm, I expect to in some way be served. But when I have other people in my home, and I'm there. I'm, my kids are running around. I'm running around. We're trying to get things picked up. We don't want people to know just how bad of pigs we are. I mean, we want the food to be good. We want the, the home to be warm and prepared because we're having guests over. If you consider this your church home, would you start to act like it? Listen, God is sending us a tremendous number of people. Look around. Like, the seats are full. They're going to be full in the next service. We may have to add a third, a third service. Lord, I mean, we're grateful for that. It's a lot, but we're willing to do it. Here's the deal, though. When guests come, do you know when they show up? Early. Because they don't know how things go here. They don't know what to expect. They don't know where uh, to check in their kids. They don't even know where the worship center is, right? So they come early trying to figure these things out. And we need you to come early to help them figure things out. I'll imagine this. You're inviting someone over to dinner in your home. How odd would it be if you didn't show up until after they were already supposed to be there? And so your guests, they're kind of milling around in your yard, checking out the shrubbery, the knocking on the door, like, what, what's happening here? Like, I was supposed to be here, and no one's here to help me. Or imagine if, if people came over to your home, and you're there, and you answer the door, and you just open the door and walk off. You're like, okay, I'm just going to invite myself in here, you know, wander around until I find the kitchen. Or That's not how things happen. When we have guests in our home, we, we're there early. We're preparing. Like We're ready to receive them. And I'm going to ask you to do the same. Like If you consider this your church home, and get here early. Stick around and stay late. As a matter of fact, here's what I want you to do specifically. I want you to devote your five minutes before and your five minutes after the worship service to simply trying to connect with people that you don't know. And I'm going to ask you to do it every single week this year. Five minutes before and five minutes after, you have full permission. We're all going to do it, so it's going to be okay to ignore your friends for five minutes on the front end and the back end. And your goal is to say, hey, how can I connect with new people? Who is someone that I can, that's a stranger to me that I can turn into a friend? Are the people I can connect with and ask about their life? And maybe they're new to town and I can help them figure out what it looks like to live in Poto, Oklahoma. We're kind of unique. You know what I'm saying? So five minutes before and five minutes after. Make this your home. Number two, treat it like your home. If you see someone here and they're alone, treat it like an emergency. And Our guests shouldn't have to wander around and, and, and try to figure out, like, hey, where do my kids go? Where's the worship center? How do I get called? Like, how does it function? We, when we see someone alone, it's an emergency to us. And so even if we're engaged in conversation or whatever, we should go and care for our guests. Well, we want to practice hospitality. Once again, if this is your church home, we need you to act like it. Show here early. Show up here early. Be a servant. Show hospitality. And then the final thing is just to invite and invest. Once again, the same as personal hospitality. Invite and invest. People... The 30,000 people that live within a 15-mile radius of this, they will never know that they're welcome here if we don't invite them. And there are people that have been hurt by churches, have had tough experiences, people whose lives are falling apart, who need to have the hope of Jesus Christ. Listen, I believe this is the greatest church in our county. I know there's great churches, right? I'm just a little partial. This church has transformed my life. God has used you to be an incredible blessing to me and my family and what I want to do is share that with other people. And so we're going to encourage you just to invite. Invite your friends and coworkers. There's a, been multiple studies now that come out regarding people, particularly in the South. 80% of people say, if someone would invite me, I will go to church this Sunday. 80% of 30,000 people would say, if someone would just take the time to invite me, to make me feel welcome, I would show up at church this Sunday. Listen, I want everyone to experience the saving grace of Jesus Christ, the overwhelming power of the gospel to transform us. I want everyone to know what it is to become a disciple of Jesus. So I'm going to ask you to invite people. And when they come, you take them around. You show them where to go, where to sit. You can, you know, get them your favorite coffee, whatever it may be, that you would host them well here. And if you see new people that show up here, uh, that you would choose to invest in them. Maybe you take them to dinner afterward. 
But you simply just take the time to begin to show hospitality in your personal life. This is a day-to-day thing. New coworkers, you know, new students in your class, whatever it may be. And then we do so corporately. I believe God has incredible things ahead for us. Now, this might even be so significant. Those of you who are in your community groups, and this has been a struggle for us. And community groups are amazing. We're tight, and I love those people. But one of the things we don't do very well is invite new people in. And the reason we don't do it is because it's costly. Because it kind of messes up our mojo a little bit, right? We, we know who to trust. We know what we can share. We're comfortable. It, it works well. Let me just challenge you that maybe there will be a time where you need to invite someone new into your community group. And that will be hard. It will be costly. But it will be worth it. We're seeking to turn strangers into friends. And prayerfully, those friends will become family through the overwhelming power of the gospel of Jesus. Here's the thing. Church. I believe we've only seen the beginning of what God wants to do in and through us. Only the beginning. And I can't wait to see what God's going to do in the future through this simple act of hospitality as we love other people as Jesus has loved us. Would you bow with me? Father, we thank you for this initiating love that you demonstrated toward us. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that... You loved us first and that you came and you, you pursued us willingly, laying down your life for us to draw us into a relationship with you. God, I pray that in faith and in obedience to you that we would practice this in our lives. That this wouldn't be a, a thing, it wouldn't be a season, but this would be a part of our lifestyle as believers, seeing ourselves as people who have been sent by God to reach out and to love people who are new and to just express this love that you've expressed to us to other people. Lord, may you use us. God, may you empower us, and may you give us joy in service. I pray this in the powerful and the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Today, I'm going to invite you to stand. We're going to have a time just to sing together. This is a body. Would you prayerfully consider making this your home? And if it's your home, starting to act like it. And what it would look like for you to invest and invite. As we sing together today, you just respond in obedience to Jesus.